so anyway, thank you guys. I'm really excited to be here. And um, you know, I feel like I've literally failed at almost everything I've tried. And yet still, I'm standing here in front of you guys today. Uh, I wanted to start by telling you guys a story uh, about myself when I was about 18 years old. Um, I can't tell because the lights are so bright how many of you guys are even going to understand what I'm even talking about. But when I was 18 years old, I was still living in my, uh, my hometown of Winnipeg, Manitoba in Canada with my parents in my first year of university. And I had this dream that I wanted to be a VJ for Much Music. And I don't know if you guys even know what that is, but it's like the Much Music is like the MTV of America. And uh, a VJ is like what Carson Daly would be if you guys have, I'm, I'm aging myself here, but hopefully you guys can kind of get the idea of what, who, what I'm talking about. And the job at the time was such a, it was such a cool job that everybody wanted it, right? And I had this idea. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get this job. And at the time, Keanu Reeves was the biggest star on the planet. The biggest. He, was, he just finished Speed and Point Break. Again, I know I'm probably dating myself, but you know, not John Wick. Um, that's now or Matrix. But um, he was. He really wanted to be a Shakespeare serious actor. So he came to Winnipeg, Manitoba to do Hamlet. And it was like the biggest news in the world because he was a huge star coming to a small town. And so I had this idea. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get Keanu to be on my demo tape for Much Music, and that's how I'm going to get this job. And I told my parents, and I told my friends. I went to school, and I like told everybody. And literally, Everyone just laughed at me. This is who I am, by the way. I'm a professional failure. Um, and they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I was really, really serious about this. And so I decided that I'm going to go and wait for Keanu outside the doors of the Manitoba Theater Center where he was doing Hamlet and you know, ask him. And I try to coerce anybody to come with me. And I should tell you guys, if you guys don't know like, what Winnipeg is like in the winter, it is like literally the coldest place like, on the planet. It's minus 50 sometimes. Like If you don't have like, the proper clothing, you just get frostbitten. So I bring my friend, one girl. You know, I had to pay her, I think. And literally, I had to pay her. I think I gave her like 10 bucks to come with me. And she lasted seven minutes. Like after seven minutes, she's like, you know what? I'm like leaving. It's not worth it. Goodbye. And I was literally by myself outside the doors waiting, hopefully, for Keanu Reeves to come out the door. And an hour passes, and then an hour and 20 minutes, and then an hour and a half, and two hours go by. And finally, he comes out of the door. And there are like cameras and media everywhere. And so I just kind of went with the media. I just you know, kind of like sashayed in there finally went through all the crowds, and I tapped him on the shoulder, tugged on his jacket, and I said, you know, Keanu, Keanu. And he was very like, distracted and felt and was really put off and looked at me. And he's like, you know, I'll, I'll give you an autograph. Just wait your turn. And, and I was like, autograph? What do I want your autograph for? No, 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 no. I, I really need your help. I really need your help. I need you to help me make a demo tape. And he was like, huh? And I was like, I was like seriously convicted. I'm like, I really need this. And he looked at me. He's like, um, why don't you just give me your phone number and we, I'll, I'll call you. And he was signing like favorites, like all these autographs. And so I was like, uh, are you really going to call me? I'm, I'm like questioning him. And he was like, I'll call you. I'll call you. And some some girl like gave me her eyeliner and I had like a, a gum wrapper and I write my number on, with my eye like, with this eyeliner and I give it to him. And I'm like, you promise you're going to call me? You promise? He's like, yeah, 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 whatever. And so I'm like, all right, well, I go home. I go to school the next day. I tell everybody. And of course, everyone laughs at me. And, uh, and no call. And then the second day, I go to school. And I, I say the same thing. And my friends are all like, yeah, did Keanu call you? Yet? And I'm like, no, no, he didn't call me yet. And the third day happened, same thing. And then the fourth day, you got it. Same thing happens. And I go home. And my mom says to me, did you hear the answering machine? Did you listen to your messages? And, Again, I'm dating myself. We had answering machines back then. And I was like, no. And I go listen. And I hear my mom on my answering machine. And I hear, like, hello. and Because at the time, it's like an answering machine. And I hear, hello, is Jennifer there? 
And then my mom's like, hello, who is this? Like, and, like and some man's on the phone. She, and he's like, hi, um, my name's Keanu. Um, is Jennifer there? And my mom's like, she's at school, call back. And she, she hangs up the phone, like it's completely not even like paying attention. Thankfully, he calls back again and I'm like listening to this message like in hysterics, right? And he says, hi Jennifer, um, I met you the other night, you were saying something and you had such conviction, but I, I don't know what you were talking about, here's my number, call me back. Cut to, I call him back after I like calmed myself down and um, next thing you know, he is literally on my sofa in Winnipeg, you know, dorky little me with my frizzy hair, and my mom made him cookies. I went to pick him up in my mom's Buick, and he comes over, and I had all my friends around the, the room, and they all had amateur cameras so I can, I can edit it together and make this great tape and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, here it is. And so I then had, what do you think? A great demo tape, right? A great demo tape. And, do you th and what do you think happened? Did, did I get a call from Much Music after I gave it in? Well, I'll tell you, I, yes, I did. I got a call from Much Music, you know? And did I get an audition? Yes, I got an audition. And, that, and then did it come down to even closer and closer? Absolutely. But did I get the job? No, I did not get the job, but, but, I did not get the job, but there's a reason why I'm telling you this story. And, but you're probably thinking, well, why? You like failed, you didn't get it, you went through all this trouble, you made a fool of yourself, but you, you know? But no, it was an extremely pivotal moment for me, because in that moment, it, it taught me something about what true success is, and that is that boldness is a much stronger indicator for success than actually brilliance. And, you know, the truth is, bold, bold people can still be brilliant, and brilliant people can still be bold. But the truth is, boldness is the secret sauce, and boldness is the thing that takes you on the path to success. See, when you're so smart, you tend to overthink everything, and you can think of all of the negative outcomes that can happen if things go wrong. So you don't take action. But bold people think of all of the positive potential things that can go right. So they do. So I guess what the, when you think to yourself, what does it mean to be bold? Bold to me means you chase what you want and you don't just take what you get. And Unfortunately, most people live on default because they have fear of failure, fear, fear of rejection, fear of looking stupid, and it's a lot of self-doubt. So what happens is they acquiesce to what's convenient, they take what's in front of them, and they don't necessarily take the shot. So that's why we get stuck in jobs that we don't want because we don't actually apply or go after the job that we want. We go on to Indeed or Monster, if that even exists still, <laughs> it doesn't, LinkedIn, and we see what's available versus going after that exact, exact job that we really want. And guess what? That's why we don't make as much money as we would like to make because we don't even ask for it. There was a survey done with over 160,000 people who believe they deserved a raise. And really, most of them didn't even ask for it. Two thirds of those people didn't even ask for a raise. But the people that did ask, the people that did ask, over 70% actually got the raise. So you don't, of course, the answer will always be no if you don't even ask the question. So again, what is bold to me? Bold is chasing what you want, not just taking what you get and living on default. Now, people misunderstand what it means to be bold. People think that you're either born with boldness or you're not. And the truth is that's just not true. Boldness is a skill like anything else. If you want to get super strong and get a six pack, you go to the gym one time and then go home, no. If you want to learn a language, if you want to learn French, Mandarin, Chinese, do you take one lesson and then say, meh, 
You don't speak fluent after that. If you want to run a marathon, if you want to run the Boston Marathon, do you just run a lap around the school and then say, okay, you know what, I'm going to, start, I'm, I'm going to go into the Boston Marathon? No. No. You t it takes practice. The more practice you have, the better you get at something. And that's why I want to talk to you about a mindset that I developed called the 10% target. Now, the 10% target is a super simple thing. You make 10 attempts at whatever the thing is you want most in life. But you must make 10 attempts. See, people don't make 10 attempts. Most people don't even make one attempt because they count themselves out before even trying. They don't even give themselves that option. You have to get comfortable with failing 90% of the time. Because this is what I know. If you do the 10% target, one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to get that thing you want, or another opportunity will present itself that you never knew existed. I mean, it is literally to a T, I guarantee it. Now, you need to get comfortable with that 90%. So the question is, how do you get comfortable failing 90% of the time? And just how you train your body to be fit, you can train your brain to be bold. You can reprogram your brain. That's a superhuman quality that we all have. You can do a new behavior over and over again, which becomes your new normal. And you just need to do it. Just talking's not enough. Reading about it is not enough. Deliberating about it is not enough. You need to actually execute and practice the failing. You've got to get comfortable with failing. Now, I have a whole thing here I was going to do about all the colossal failures that I've done because there's been many, many. I literally have a master's in failing, but because of this 10% target, I have a PhD in getting right back up. Because, because the truth is, the 10% target, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The 10% target works literally 100% of the time. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I was not the best student. I was not MIT, nor even MTT. But, <laughs> but, and I was not the best athlete or the prettiest girl. But I will tell you something. I still was able to write best-selling books, sell numerous companies as an entrepreneur for millions of dollars. I was able to start a charity raising millions of dollars for breast cancer, which is a charity close to my heart, all by failing 90% of the time. And so can you. You could fail 90% of the time, too, by asking for what you want. Because that's training your brain. And that's chasing what you want. But failing doesn't make you a failure. And rejection is always better than regret. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>